Hey everyone, in this lesson I'm going to talk to you guys about mTOR signaling um, and more specifically I'm going to talk to you guys about um, the mTOR complexes. Um, I'm going to also get into, the, into a lot of detail on how mTOR is actually regulated and I'm also going to tell you guys about the many many different effects that mTOR actually has within the cell. So what is mTOR? Well mTOR is the mechanistic or mammalian target of rapamycin. Now, rapamycin was uh, first discovered in 1964 on the island of Rapa Nui, um, which is also known as Easter Island. And rapamycin was found to have immunosuppressive and anti-tumor properties. Now, it wasn't until 1994 um, that uh, researchers actually discovered mTOR. Um, so it took about 30 years for them to actually figure out what was going on. Um, so they knew that rapamycin was having these effects, but they didn't know what uh, target or what M rapamycin was actually targeting within the cell. What they found was that mTOR was a master regulator of growth, proliferation, and survival. And it exists as two complexes. So the two complexes, um, so the first complex um, has mTOR protein itself. Um, and now it also has Raptor, which is also known as regulatory protein associated with mTOR. And this is how... Um, the mTOR complex actually binds to its substrate. So Raptor allows the complex to bind to its substrate. Now there's another protein called MLST8, or otherwise known as G-beta-L, which um, stabilizes the kinase, um, kinase loop within mTOR complex. So it allows mTOR to phosphorylate its target. There are also two different proteins that actually have inhibitory roles within the complex. One is PRAS40, uh, which is uh, otherwise known as proline-rich AKT substrate of 40 kilodaltons. And the other one is DEPTOR, or DEP domain-containing mTOR interacting protein. So the names aren't really important. Um, the full form of the, the names aren't really important, but just realize that um, the complex is made up with many different proteins that have both activating and inhibiting functions. And this whole complex here is what's known as mTOR complex 1 or mTOR C1. The other mTOR complex um, is similar. So it, it also has the mTOR protein. One of the main differences in the, in the uh, second complex is that it has something known as Richter um, instead of Raptor. So Richter is uh, known as rapamycin insensitive companion of mTOR. So, and that allows um, this complex to actually bind to its substrate. So, Richter um, is kind of analogous to Raptor in the sense that it allows, um, allows mTOR complex 2 to actually bind to its substrate. Um, this complex also has MLST8, which has the same function as, um, as it does in mTOR uh, complex 1. It also has Deptor, but it also has two other proteins. Um, Proter 1 and 2, and MSIN 1, which have regulatory um, functions um, in the complex. And all of these proteins make up mTOR complex 2. So as you can see, um, the two complexes are similar in some ways, but they are different in, in, its, in terms of its regulation and its ability to bind to certain targets. Now, uh, there are also two drugs, just out of interest, um, if you guys want to know, there are two drugs. There's Torn and uh, Rapamycin, which um, uh, act to inhibit these complexes. Torn typically inhibits both complexes, while uh, uh, whereas Rapamycin is typically only inhibitory of complex 1. Um, and uh, it, it can have very uh, marginal inhibition on complex 2. So... Um, as you can see, this is how the two complexes differ in terms of their activity and their function in the cell. So now, um, how, how and what does mTOR actually do within the cell and how is it regulated? So um, I mentioned in my video on uh, the role of the lysosome in mTOR signaling that mTOR is typically regulated at the interface of the lysosomal membrane. So what it does is it actually is bound to RAG um, isoforms. And um, so this is all occurring uh, near the, uh, the lysosomal membrane. So what happens is uh, there's a protein known as REB or R-H-E-B uh, protein that activates mTOR. So um, this is where a lot of the regulation is occurring at this, at this hub. Um, so what happens is REB is actually inhibited by TSC2 or tuberous sclerosis complex 2. Now, um, 
many different proteins activate and inhibit TSC2. One of them is AMPK, um, AMP activated protein kinase. What uh, We've learned about this in another one of my lessons before. If you haven't watched that lesson, please check out overview of AMPK signaling. So AMPK um, actually activates TSC2. And as we learned before, LKB1, AMP, several other things activate AMPK. So um, when you think about it, LKB1, AMP, activate AMPK, which activate TSC2, which inhibits REB, which means that mTOR is uh, inhibited. So AMPK actually inhibits mTOR um, through a couple of different steps. Um, the next regulator, major regulator of TSC2 is AKT. Um, and AKT is traditionally known to be activated by um, growth factors such as insulin. Now, when AKT inhibits TSC2, that actu in actuality leads to the activation of mTOR C1. So just kind of think about it that way, guys. Um, if you can, just kind of, um, kind of try to look over the, the, the couple steps, TSC2 and REB steps, but just think that AMPK inhibits mTOR, AKT activates mTOR. Now, there are also a couple other um, uh, regulators that many people don't really think about. One is ERK. Um, we talked about this in the RAS, RAF, MEC, ERK uh, pathway video. Um, and ERK is actually regulated by RAS um, through a couple of different steps. So this uh, ERK actually inhibits TSC2, which means it activates mTOR C1. And another um, actually inhibitor of mTOR C1 is uh, P53. Um, P53 actually activates TSC2, and P uh, P53 is traditionally known to be activated by certain cellular structures such as DNA damage. Now, there are also regulations at the RAG site. Now, uh, the RAG isoforms are actually regulated by something known as Gator 1. Um, Gator 1 is actually regulated or inhibited by Gator 2. So Gator 1 inhibits RAG, um, Gator 2 inhibits Gator 1. Um, Castor 1 inhibits Gator 2. And now arginine actually inhibits Castor 1. So there's a it's very convoluted, but um, try not to get too bogged down in the details at this point, but just realize that if you think about it, arginine, so they, they always say Castor 1 is an arginine sensor. So um, what happens is arginine actually inhibits Castor 1, which means that Castor 1 is not able to inhibit ca uh, Gator 2, um, which means Gator 2 can actually inhibit Gator 1, which means that RAG can be activated. So in a roundabout way, arginine can actually activate mTOR C1. So just think, remember that guys, arginine can activate mTOR C1 by actually inhibiting castor 1. So it's a, it's a very roundabout complicated way, but if you can think about it that way, arginine is actually an activator of mTOR C1, that's very helpful. And now, additionally, um, there's also another inhibitor of Gator 2, which is Cestrin 2. And Cestrin 2 is actually inhibited by leucine. So again, leucine is an activator of mTOR C1 through its ability to inhibit Cestrin 2. So again, as I mentioned before, if leucine inhibits Cestrin 2, that means that Gator is not in, Gator 2 is not inhibited, which means that Gator 2 can actually inhibit Gator 1, which means that uh, Gator 1 cannot inhibit RAG, and RAG can actually activate um, mTOR C1, activate and bind to mTOR C1. Uh, so uh, I know that's very um, complex and convoluted, but hopefully that kind of makes some sense. So just remember, guys, that leucine and arginine can activate mTOR C1. So now that we know all of that very complex regulation of mTOR C1, what happens when it actually gets activated? Well, one of the f main, most important functions um, that mTOR C1 actually does is it actually phosphorylates and activates P70. S6 kinase or P76K. Um, and I mentioned this before in another video, but um, P76K is super important um, for many of the downstream effects of mTOR C1. Um, one of the f one of the first things that it actually does is it actually phosphorylates and activates CAD. And um, you might be thinking, okay, you might not have heard of CAD, but what does a CAD actually do? Well, CAD actually is involved in um, and is indispensable for pyrimidine synthesis. So one of the main things that P76K does is it uh, actually allows primitive synthesis to occur within the cell. Another thing that P76K does is it inhibits EEF2K or eukaryotic elongation factor 2 kinase. Now EEF2K actually inhibits 
EEF2 or eukaryotic elongation factor 2 through phosphorylation. And now EEF2 is actually necessary for um, elongation of, of a protein or polypeptide strand within the ribosome. Now, um, since P76K can inhibit EEF2K, that means that EEF2 is activated. Another thing that P76K can do is it actually activates um, eukaryotic initiation factor 4B, or EIF4B, which is again necessary for um, polypeptide um, translation within the ribosome. Now, um, and then another thing that it can do is uh, P76K can actually directly phosphorylate the S6 ribosomal subunit and activate the ribosome. So, as you can see, the uh, P70, P70S6K is an important signaling hub in mTOR um, signaling, and allows many of the different um, many of the different um, downstream effects to occur, um, such as ribosomal activation, polypeptide translation and synthesis, and pyrimidine synthesis. Now, another thing that mTOR C1 does is it actually phosphorylates and inhibits um, EIF4E binding protein 1, so or otherwise known as 4-EBP1. Now, 4-EBP1 is actually an inhibitor of EIF4E, as I mentioned before, which is eukaryotic initiation factor 4E. Um, and it actually does, um, it actually inhibits EIF4E by binding to it and um, destabilizing its ability to bind to EIF4G, which is another initiation factor that is necessary for polypeptide synthesis. So, um, in um, mTOR's ability to inhibit 4EBP1, it actually allows activation of EIF4E and EIF4G to allow it to also um, initiate polypeptide translation and synthesis at the ribosome. And this all, again, leads to protein synthesis. So all of these convoluted um, targets that mTOR leads to all eventually lead to um, protein synthesis to occur. Now, because protein synthesis is activated in the cell, the cell does not want to have protein degradation pathways active um, at the same time. So what it does is mTOR actually will inhibit ULK1, which is UNC51-like kinase 1, um, and it does so by phosphorylating uh, ULK1. Now, what it does, um, ULK1 actually is um, very important um, for initiating um, some of the beginnings of autophagosomal um, autophagosomal production or um, or maturation during macroautophagy. So mTOR actually inhibits this process from occurring. Now mTOR also inhibits um, by phosphorylation, um, it inhibits TFEB or transcription factor EB, which is um, the master regulator of lysosomal biogenesis and is also a master regulator of many of the different autoph autophagy proteins. Um, so in in mTOR inhibiting TFEB can actually reduce autophagy as well. So mTOR will increase protein synthesis um, by many of the mechanisms um, that I mentioned before, but it can also inhibit autophagy and inhibit um, protein degradation. So you don't have two competing processes occurring at the same time. Now um, there are many other um, many other targets that mTOR also activates and inhibits. Now um, just for completion. Um, I just wanted to just mention these briefly to you guys. Um, I know um, mTOR is a very complex protein. It's been very well studied, um, and there's so many regula regulators, and there's so many th targets of mTOR um, that I just want to mention a couple of them to you guys first off. So um, mTOR can, um, I have in red here the targets that are inhibited, and the green target is one that's activated. So ATF4 is a transcription factor involved in ER stress. That's actually inhibited by mTOR. ERK5 is a uh, is a protein involved in uh, proteasomal um, degradation, so that's actually inhibited. So that kind of lead that kind of is similar to um, it um, mTOR actually inhibiting protein degradation. It also inhibits lipin one, and it also activates um, HIF one alpha or hypoxia inducible factor one alpha. So um, I just wanted to let you guys know that now, just for out of completion, but just know that um, the ones I mentioned before are the main uh, things I want you guys to take from this, that it increases protein synthesis and it decreases protein degradation pathways in the cell. Now just to summarize 
um, some of the effects of mTOR um, complex one. Um, what are what is mTOR complex one? How is it activated? Well, one of the main things I mentioned before was that amino acids activate mTOR C1. Another thing is that growth factors activate mTOR C1, like such as insulin. Remember, as I mentioned before, AKT is activated by insulin, and AKT leads to an inhibition of uh, TSC2, which leads to activation of mTOR. Energy is an activator of mTOR. Energy in the form of ATP. So ATP will um, actually reduce AMPK signaling. And remember, as I mentioned before, AMPK is an inhibitor of mTOR C1, which means that if you have more cellular energy, that means that AMPK signaling is decreased, which means that mTOR um, signaling is increased. But there are also inhibitors of mTOR complex one. Um, DNA damage is one of them. There's other stressors that can cause um, inactivation of mTOR. And there's also AMPK, or AMP. And as I mentioned before, that is um, because of AMPK activation. So AMP activates AMPK, which then inhibits mTOR C1. But when, AM, when mTOR C1 is actually activated, what does it actually do? Well, as I mentioned before, it inhibits autophagy and other protein degradation um, pathways. It activates protein synthesis, and it activates nucleotide synthesis. So those are the main uh, points I want you guys to know um, for mTOR um, C1 signaling. Now, I didn't really mention much about mTOR C2 signaling. One of the really only well thought of um, processes or things that activate mTOR complex 2 is growth factors. Now, it's really well known that insulin actually activates uh, mTOR complex 2. And now, what does mTOR complex 2 actually do? Well, one thing it does is, is it actually activates AKT. AKT actually inhibits apoptosis through its ability to regulate um, um, FOXO proteins. Now, that's not important, but just realize that AKT is important in regulating and inhibiting apoptosis. Another thing is that AKT is important in regulating uh, glucose metabolism. We all know why, as I mentioned before during my insulin signaling um, cascade video. Um, mTOR complex 2 is also known to regulate um, uh, protein kinase C um, isoforms. Now, it, this is um, actually the first substrate that it was found to actually bind to. Um, it was protein kinase C. Now, it, it actually binds to many different isoforms of protein kinase C, delta, zeta, and so on. But um, what's really important is that protein kinase C is important in cytoskeletal reorganization. And the last target that I want to talk to you guys about for mTOR complex 2 is SGK, which is important for ion transport. So um, as you can see, mTOR complex 2 is important in a lot of um, different things such as um, apoptosis, um, so it, in, it leads to an inhibition of apoptosis, so it really increases cell survival, it regulates glucose metabolism, it regulates cytoskeletal reorganization, and it regulates ion transport. But most of the things that we know about mTOR come from mTOR complex 1, so I just wanted to tell you guys a little bit about mTOR complex 2. So anyways guys, um, I hope you found this video very helpful, that was an in-depth look at mTOR complex signaling. If you found this video helpful, please like and subscribe um, for more videos like this one. And anyways, guys, thank you so much for watching, and have a great day.